Salut. Bienvenue au podcast de Tribble Trip. Welcome to the Travel Tribe Podcast. Ahoy, mermaids and mermen. What's it like to sail the world and have the seas be your full-time home? Today on the Travel Tribe, we have Brian Troutman from the mighty S. Fidelos joining us. Almost a decade ago, Brian came up with a four-year plan to sell everything he had and buy a sailboat to sail the world and get off the grid. What was supposed to be an 18-month journey heading to New Zealand ended up being an adventure spanning a decade long. He now lives sustainably on the sailboat with his wife Karen from Sweden and their baby Sierra. Since his original journey, he has sailed 83,000 nautical miles, which is the equivalent of circling the equator three times. He has visited six of the seven continents and sailed in all the major oceans of the world. Today, we chat about his inspiration for the journey, what it's like to live on a sailboat full-time and raise a family, his attempts of living sustainably, and some of the fun adventures they have, such as exploring remote islands. How are you doing today, Brian? Uh, I'm doing great. Thanks for that intro. It sounds uh, sounds very impressive. So thank you for that uh, boosting it up there. Where are you joining us from today? Uh, at the moment, we are in Annapolis, Maryland, uh, in a little place where we have the boat tied up. Uh, we only go to a dock maybe once or twice a year uh, when we need to perform some pretty major maintenance. And right now, the engine is in pieces. Uh, you know, I've got the injector pumps taken off, doing some pretty uh, big maintenance, timing belt and a bunch of other things. And when we do that, uh, I need to have the boat tied up somewhere safe so that if the wind blows like it did the other night, we don't drag away and uh, smash into the rocks and sink. So, I wanted to take it back a decade ago when we were much, much younger, back in Flagstaff, Arizona, when you were still working as a software engineer. Can you tell us how did you get inspired for this idea? Where did it come from? Well, you know, it's, it's so I, I grew up in Flagstaff, uh, landlocked Arizona, and I was actually working for the phone company. So I was the guy, I was a union employee. I was the guy that would climb the telephone poles to go hook up the lines. And I love that job because it was amazing. I got to, I, have a, I had like a big truck. I had a ladder. I get to climb. I got to drive up in the mountains and just work in these amaz- amazingly beautiful places. And I used that job to put myself through university. Uh, And so I moved up to Seattle and I went to the University of Washington, got my electrical engineering degree, uh, graduated and went straight into the software industry after that. So something quite different. And I remember, you know, working at that job and and being somewhat content. You know, I, I had everything that you were supposed to have. You know, I had a house, I had a mortgage, I had a nice car. I was able to take vacations and, you know, eat out at nice restaurants. But I was still like, had this feeling of, you know, is this it? Is this what I want to do for the next, you know, 30 or 40 years of my life? And at some point it, it just clicked that, you know, I actually want to, you know, I was 30, uh, what, 32 at that time. And uh, I went into the library and uh, I read this book about, uh, it was called uh, Three Years in a 12 Foot Boat. And it was a story about this guy who basically built a very small boat on his balcony and he took off on this three-year trip just exploring and sailing this tiny little boat down rivers and it was just this incredible adventure and I said you know what I want to do something like that and so I knew nothing about sailing um, but I bought a small 22 foot boat I started sailing her around uh, first Lake Washington and Lake Union and Seattle, and then finally out into the Puget Sound. And I did that for a number of years. And, you know, as my kind of career progressed, I finally one day was was driving on the bus and I looked out the window and I was just thinking about, you know, my time and, and what it meant to me. And that, in fact, my bus ride commuting to and from work was the favorite part of my day. And I had to really step back and think about like, you know, why is that? You know, why you you, you should, you have this incredible opportunity to, to be in business and and go to meetings and help customers. And I was like, that's great. But everybody always, you know, my, my life is segmented into 50 minute chunks. You know, I have 50 minutes to go to this meeting, 50 minutes to do this conference call, 10 minutes to prepare for the next one. And that was all of my day. And, And when I wasn't doing that, I was answering emails, you know, and, I just thought, you know what, if the bus ride is the favorite part of my day, then I really need to change something. And so I decided to uh, basically resign uh, from my company with my partners. Uh, I bought uh, the sailboat, which is 
Delos, a, a boat, a 53 foot catch that was capable of sailing across oceans. And uh, I saved up all my money. I sold everything I owned, house, cars, everything. Um, basically went from a you know pretty big three bedroom, two bath house to what would be considered something the size of a studio apartment in space, uh, a boat. And um, decided to go for, I had enough money to last me about 18 months. Uh, and the idea was just to try and sail to New Zealand, the other side of the Pacific Ocean. You know, it seemed like an exotic sailing destination and very cool. And that was uh, pretty much the only thing I had planned and um, just went wow. and ended up, you know, falling in love with the lifestyle. And it, it just changed the way that I look at the value of why I'm here and my time on this world. And well, what the heck, I, I better make the best of it. And so I actually just never came back. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I know how it is. I, I almost hearing you say that almost mimics the same uh, phrases and words I used during a podcast interview for my friend's uh, show. I said the same thing. I said, like, I remember being at work and being, is this what the rest of my life is going to be like for the next 30, 40 years? There's got to be more to this. So it's kind of interesting, the parallels between that crossroad where you make that decision of, you know, I want to do something kind of bigger or more adventurous. And I know that taking on that kind of decision is never easy. What kind of fears did you have prior to making that leap of faith? Oh, so many. I mean, there was social fears. There was the fear of being, uh, you know, losing friends and, and being out of contact with family because, you know, all the friends I had were in Seattle or definitely in the U S and my family was in the U S. Um, and, uh, you know, then there was economic fears of like, you know, okay, I'm going to sell my house. I'm going to get out of the housing market. Am I ever going to be able to get back in? Uh, what am I going to do when I run out of money? Am I going to be able to go back to work? Um, I mean, that's, there, there was also, I remember at least the first six months, I felt really guilty for having time. You know, I, I had no idea what to do with myself. And I, I was like, well, I can't just sit here in the morning and drink a cup of coffee and read and stare at the ocean like that's certainly not possible to do and i i remember just busying myself with things like okay i have to go here i have to go do this i have to take a picture of this i have to write this i have to work on the boat do these projects and it took me a while to to finally realize that well you might as well just do the best that you can and enjoy it as much as possible otherwise you'll go nuts you know absolutely absolutely and what was uh, other than and the time difference, what other was, uh, what other transitions did you have to go through on your first couple of days? So I'm just kind of envisioning you, you know, throwing away this monotonous and routine lifestyle and then going on for this completely crazy adventure. And those first couple of days, I bet the adrenaline's pumping. What was a transition like? Anything else other than the, the time, extra amount of time? Well, I remember being terrified the first time we came out of, uh, of the Strait of Juan de Fuca, which is what separates basically British Columbia, Canada from Washington State, where Seattle is. And then you make a left turn and you sail down the coast, and it's a very notorious chunk of water. There's usually big wind and big waves and everything. And I remember motoring out there, getting into the wind, and then it was just all of a sudden very calm. And, you know, we were prepared for the worst gale storm force winds and and we actually didn't see more than five knots the whole way down to san francisco and so it was sort of an anticlimactic experience which i think is good because if, if it had been terrorizing that it probably would have affected me in a much different way um but uh you know that that was it just to try and get down to to warmer weather before the the winter came in and uh and i've made the decision to go with something that kind of put that knot in my stomach that kind of said like, hey, this is not the safe choice. This might be risky, but on the other side, the benefits are, you know, the payoff is huge. And, you know, mm -hmm. that, that was one of those times. And I've probably had, you know, three or four of those times, at least during during the trip. Every few years, some really pivotal decision uh, pops up where I, I have to make a, a potentially life-altering choice. When, and, you know, one of them happened in... Uh, New Zealand and Australia when I, when I got down there and, and I, you know, was two and a half years now into the 18 month trip and uh, flat broke, to be honest, you know, I, I had gone through the savings that I had set aside. Now I'm on the other side of the world uh, with a boat that needs maintenance. And, um, you know, I, I have to find money and I have no job or prospects for employment. And I thought, well, you know, what am I going to do? Am I going to, uh, to 
pack it in, sell the boat, move back to the States, try and find work again, or, or do I find a way to press on? And um, I actually ended up being a, a day worker mm-hmm. in a super yacht yard in Auckland was the first thing I did. I literally would just go around to, to boats or, or find people in the dock and ask them if they needed help uh, uh, on their boats. And I would do anything. I would paint, I would repair electronics. I would, you know, fill their dinghies. I would run errands, do whatever for, you know, an hourly rate or a daily rate. And, uh, that, you know, I did that for about six months and that gave me enough money to, uh, to go sailing for the next season. So it was kind of like that for a little while. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I bet that was terrifying. Speaking of the financial side, um, if someone was looking to go ahead and follow this, uh, path as well, what would you recommend as a, I know it probably varies a lot, but what would you recommend as the amount of money someone would need to have saved up or budgeted in order to get started? Wow. Well, it depends completely on your lifestyle as it does. Like, you know, if you live in mm-hmm. on land in a house, you can, you can be eating crazy expensive food and living in a mansion, or you can, live fairly cheaply making your own food on, on, you know, in a studio apartment and boats are very much the same way. Uh, we have a pretty well outfitted boat and I can tell you that our monthly budget for two people on board is about $2,400 per month. And so that's about $1,200 per person that pays for our, our insurance for the boat that pays for our fuel that pays for repairs and maintenance you know, three meals a day, food, miscellaneous fees, a little bit of entertainment, things like that. Um, that's assuming that, you know, you own the boat and it's paid for and you don't have a mortgage on whatever boat you choose because boats can be anywhere from $10,000 to, you know, millions of dollars. There's an incredible range there. Um, and I just mm-hmm. happened to buy a mm-hmm. boat that was pretty much a, 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 a the same value as the house I sold. So it was kind of like a, a, a straight across trade there for me. Just trade. Yeah, that's great. And so you kind of get to Australia, you ran out of money, you had to make some, uh, do a little bit of work to get back uh, up there. So then how did you kind of transition to continuing to sustain your lifestyle after that in order to not continue to have to dock the boat and work? Did you uh, get any jobs online? Yeah, well, let's see. After we worked in New Zealand, uh, we sailed through another part of the South Pacific, we went through like uh, Fiji and Vanuatu, uh, Solomon Islands, and then we actually ended up in Cairns, Australia. Uh, and once again, you know, my brother was sailing with me across the South Pacific. My brother Brady, he, he actually was supposed to come and just help me sail the boat from Mexico to Tahiti. Uh, he was going to stay on board a month. He actually ended up staying with me the whole trip. He, he just left last year. We had like 10 years of sailing together, which is to sail with your, you know, your sibling for that long is just, it's, it, we had so many is amazing experience. Um, but we got to Australia once again, broke, uh, this time we parked the boat. Uh, we decided to move uh, ashore, uh, for about a year. Uh, so we actually took Delos out of the water. We stored her in a, a port in Southern Queensland uh, called Bundaberg. There's some r- good rum that comes from Bundy. Uh, and we moved to Melbourne and we, uh, rented, a, a little apartment. Uh, my brother Brady, uh, he was under 30. And if you're in Australia or New Zealand, you can get the working holiday visa. So he automatically is able to get a one year working visa. So he uh, managed a Mexican restaurant, which is, which is pretty funny. And uh, I went back to doing computer consulting at that point for a year. Um, And uh, my wife, uh, Karen, I actually met around that time and she was in university going to to landscape architecture school uh, at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology in Melbourne. Uh, so we did that. We worked for, yeah, about a year uh, doing, I was, you know, I sitting at home coding 10, 12 hours a day uh, for approximately a year. And then we all kind of pulled our money together and got the boat fixed up again. And then we we took off for Southeast Asia. And it was really during that time that we had the idea of making videos about the lifestyle because our our parents and our friends, you know, mom and dad, they, we were writing a blog and we were taking some photos and things, but it really didn't do the lifestyle justice. And so we decided like, Hey, you know, why don't I buy a $200 camcorder? And then we did a Google search on how do you make a YouTube video, some real basic stuff. And, um, we just started it mostly for that reason to show the friends and family what the lifestyle was about. And then, 
Uh, I remember about five or six months later, we started getting emails uh, from YouTube that, hey, so-and-so has subscribed to your channel. And I was like, well, why are, you know, why are these people even interested in this lifestyle? And it turns out that people were interested uh, because I had inadvertently made the videos public uh, because I didn't think anybody would be watching anyway. And then people started watching and people started subscribing and um, we just organically built it built it like that making making the videos i remember the first time that we made any money was when i found out that youtube had monetization and i was like well if people mm-hmm. can watch the videos and then you can enable monetization on the videos and you can make some money then that's that's amazing and i remember we were making like one dollar a day and you know we we're pretty skimpy budget i was like well one dollar a day where we are that 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 can buy like three beers a day that's that's incredible <laughs> and, you know what More if we can scale ice. this <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and what if we can scale this by like 10 times, you know, and if we can scale it by 10 times, now we're making 10 bucks a day. And if we can do it again, yeah. now we're making a hundred bucks a day. And then, you know, at that point, it starts to be self-sustainable. And it took uh, three, almost four years. Uh, but I remember at the time where we got up to, we were uh, probably about 13 or 14,000 subscribers on the channel. Uh, then we were able to make enough to to kind of make the trip sustainable if, if we lived very carefully, mostly due to, mm-hmm. to crowdfunding, not necessarily the YouTube AdSense revenue, but mostly from uh, Patreon, uh, which is our crowdfunding platform. You know, the, the people, be, I, somebody, one of our viewers actually emailed me and he said, hey, have you, have you heard about this new crowdfunding concept? He's like, if you sign up for this, I will become your first support supporter. And the idea was that, you know, the people watching the videos, they like the content enough that instead of us taking, you know, a year off, they would rather send us, you know, three bucks, five bucks, whatever it is, uh, to ensure that we're able to keep sharing the videos because they, they like to watch them and learn from them and live vicariously. And, uh, that's, that's actually how we're, how we're able to continue running the project now is just from that. And can fund, uh, f- uh, flowing in the, in the devils. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's very, uh, that's very interesting. And so when you guys were going into YouTube and making room to see that there is a potential to have it become your full-time job, were there any kind of, let's say, tips or uh, things you did, maybe content-wise, that really kind of helped you scale and, and become viral and, and grow much quicker? I think the biggest thing was, well, first of all, we always decided that we wanted to make videos that we would look back on 30 years from now and have a good laugh at. So whatever we did, it had to be not fake. It couldn't be scripted. It had to be genuine and it had to be just us. It had to be personal. I think that was a key thing that we had from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then the second we found was consistency. You know, when we first start, we were just kind of editing and I would put out a video like one month and then two months would go by and then I'd put out another video and then another month would go by. And uh, I found that when we started to be consistent, you know, first, instead of doing the randomness, we started doing two videos a month, you know, every two weeks that helps. And then a little while later, Mm -hmm. we're like, well, if we really buckle down and everybody that's on the boat pitches in, uh, we can do a video once a week. And then, you know, we started this thing where every Friday we're going to launch a video and that consistency helped people know that, Hey, it's, you know, it's Friday. I, I, there's probably a Delos video out. I'll, I'll subscribe to the channel because it's regularity and it's consistency. And we always tried to make them like a, a good length. Like, you know, when we first started, they were like, 15 to 17 minutes and now we usually try and make them like somewhere between 20 and 25 minutes so it's it's something that you sit down and and kind of watch uh, as you would like maybe a, a series show or something like that and i think that concept also really helped because then people instead of watching just one video and disappearing then they were watching two three four five videos or more and that helps with you know the stats on YouTube, it shows that you're making actually interesting videos, we had hope, and people are into watching them and you get good engagement and uh, then YouTube's mm-hmm. more likely to recommend you to other people, right? That's great. You got the whole team buckling down to cranking out, out videos, baby Sierra over there filming <laughs> GoPro videos on her first underwater adventures. <laughs> exactly, yeah. 
That, that's great. And do you guys have any like die die hard fans who are messaging you guys or sending you gifts or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's 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 definitely some of that. I mean, people are just incredibly kind and generous to us. And uh, you know, for for example, the dock that we're at right now, um, it's just a house, and you know, we were sailing here. And somebody sent us a message on Instagram and it said, hey, you know, if you'd like a safe and private place to keep the boat while you're in Annapolis, uh, give us a, a ring. And they, I, I just had a good feeling about these people. And they just turned out to be a super nice couple who love sailing and the sailing lifestyle. They have dreams of sailing them, themselves and they've been watching their videos and they just have this their boat is uh, in storage for the winter. So this dock is sitting here empty. And they said, oh, if you just want to tie up and use it while you're here, you're welcome to. And, um, you know, so we're, we're able to really do it because of the, the kindness and generosity of people like that. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, we, we, we do get some things like that, which is which is amazing. And we, we have friends uh, in, in a lot of places we go. Uh, we get a lot of cool local knowledge. People bring us local food. People bring local beer, uh, wine, alcohol, their, their favorite things. And that's that's always yeah. nice as well. Yeah. That's heartwarming. That's that's good to hear. And just logistically speaking, I'm kind of curious because I've never been on a, a transatlantic or across the ocean sail trip. Are you guys able to get Wi-Fi uh, when you're in, in the middle of the ocean or are you guys completely off the grid? Well, we used to be completely off the grid. Uh, I mean, we, we have a uh, we initially had a, a single sideband radio. Like, and I had that since the beginning of the trip. And that's basically like a marine ham radio where you can, you can send and receive very basic emails. It's, you know, like the slowest of the slow. It's even slower than, I don't know if you remember the original, original dial-up modems was like 300 bits per second or something like that. It's, it's that speed when it connects. Mm-hmm. And then a couple of years later, this thing mm-hmm. called the Iridium Go came out. And the Iridium Go is like, uh, it's a satellite communicator and you can make calls on it and you can send uh, SMS messages and you can do text emails. And it's approximately the speed of like maybe a 2.4K dial-up modem or you know something like that. You can get check weather. It's 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 very basic, but it allows you some connectivity. It's pretty reliable. Uh, this past year, we've been testing out a, a satellite-based broadband system from a company called Viasat. They do uh, they're the ones that put like internet in like SAS and JetBlue. If you've ever done a transatlantic flight and you're using the internet, uh, then it's, it's probably one of their systems. And I met one of their product managers just randomly when I was uh, in, uh, in Southampton in the UK at a boat show. And um, he said, hey, you know, I, we have this new system. We're getting into the maritime market. Would you like to try it out for us? And I said, sure, why not? And so we we basically configured a, a system that should be used for a, a giant ship, like a, a cruise ship or a cargo ship or something. And we scaled down the equipment uh, and then we mounted on the back. And now we literally have, um, you know, like 100 megabit per second internet anywhere, <laughs> anywhere in the ocean, which is pretty, pretty bizarre. Um, and so that that's pretty cool. So we, you know, if, if we, we don't have to be offline now, but we, we tend to leave it off most of the time because we do, we notice that when we're, when we do get connected, we're always checking our phones, we're always checking our emails and you really lose that, that original thing that is so good about being at sea and being off the grid is just the quiet and the disconnection. And so it has a big power switch on it. We turn it on when we need to work for a few hours in the morning and then it goes off and then, you know, the phones go silent and uh, then we just enjoy our time. But it's, That's, you know, for us, since, since we, we do this as our job and as our income, it's, it's necessary to have connectivity. And uh, before we had this satellite, the first thing that we would do when we got into a port is we would go buy a local SIM card and we would basically buy just as much data as we could afford uh, and, and, you know, use a SIM card like that. Yeah. Um, so speaking of being off the grid, uh, could you tell me what's it like to cross an ocean using only the power of the wind? I just watched a video of you. Um, I think it was in New York city and you just came off the, uh, using the motor and getting wind power and you were so fired up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tell me a little bit about that experience and what it's like. 
uh, it's just magical. You know, it's like, you know, you, the engine is running and then you put up sails and the boat heels over and it suddenly becomes more stable. And then, you know, the boat starts to pick up speed and uh, you turn the engine off and it just becomes completely quiet and you can feel the, the power of the ocean, the power of the wind, and you can hear the waves hitting the hull. And it's, I don't know, it's, it's just a magical experience. And the fact that, you know, you, you can't just point the boat where you want to go and it just goes there. I mean, you have to, you know, you can't sail directly into the wind. You have to consider different things. We have different sails for different conditions and we have to navigate uh, based on that. And we have to avoid shallow water and reefs. So it's, it's extremely challenging, but um, it's very fulfilling. And, uh, you know, when we go on a long passage, like our longest sail to date has been almost 20 days. And so, you know, usually the first two or three days you're adjusting to the motion of the boat and to living, you know, while moving a different sleep pattern because we're required to keep watch. uh, You know, we keep watch 24 hours a day. And so there's no place to stop and anchor and sleep or rest for the night. Like there's always somebody that has to be on lookout. And so, you know, we're looking at radar, we're looking for lights, we're checking the sails, we're looking at the barometer to look for changes in weather uh, you also need to feed the crew on board. And so we're, we're cooking food and we're, you know, reading books and it's, it's everything that you would do in a normal life, but you're doing it at sea and, and hopefully good weather. Although sometimes you can get tossed around and get quite rough. But, uh, I think my, my favorite feeling in the world is just when we're about ready to leave a port and, you know, because the opportunities are endless, you know, the boat is full of supplies and provisions. We, we usually have about three months of food on board. So we're, and, and fuel and everything. And, uh, you know, we we check out your, your passport gets stamped and you clear a country. And then suddenly you're in this gray area between countries for, you know, days or sometimes weeks and knowing that, you know, you could literally go anywhere that on the ocean provided the weather is nice is, and, and get there safely and, and comfort is, is an amazing feeling. And there's been times where we've actually just kept on going like, Oh, do you want to stop at this end? Like, nah, I, we're in the groove or in the rhythm. We just want to keep on sailing. And, um, you know, mm-hmm. it's nice to have that flexibility. It's super cool. Yeah. It sounds like a very freeing and, um, exciting period, you know, you get the butterflies in, in your stomach. It's like when it happens when I go to the airport, whenever I'm flying yeah, somewhere I'm excited exactly. about what the adventures coming up or, you know, the new people I'll meet or the new sites I'll see, you know, you just get really fired up about it. Um, so speaking of everybody working on the boat and you guys consistently, you know, feeding and watching and doing radar. I was just curious, like what happens when you get in an argument with your wife? Like if you like where you can't really go anywhere, right? Are you like, I'm going to the front <laughs> of the it. boat. Like don't talk to me for one hour. Or <laughs> yeah. I mean, is it, is you it know, stuff down there? Uh, there, of course, you know, we're, we're people. And usually bef- before we had our daughter, we used to always sail with uh, at least six people on the boat because we, we like to have a lot of people around. It helps with the maintenance and the sailing. And it is also a lot of fun to travel with, with friends. Um, and so, you know, when you get six adults and, you know, a tiny, tiny boat, I mean, a 53 foot boat sounds big, but when you get six people on board, it's, you know, it's, you're on top of each other all the time. Uh, I think you really learn to respect people's time you know if if you see somebody go outside and sit on the back deck and just stare at the ocean you know maybe you shouldn't go up and say hey is everything okay maybe you should just let them have you know their time they're probably seeking a little bit of time to themselves you know people tend to spend a lot of time listening to music listening to podcasts uh reading and and just sitting and staring uh sleeping you know people tend to sleep a lot on the ocean i think one of the the two reasons. The first thing is like one of the initial signs of sickness is, is fatigue and tiredness. And then, you know, when you have uh, that many people on board and the only thing you have to do is your three or four hour watch and you do twice of those a day, then you have these, you know, incredible chunks of like, you know, let's say 18 hours of your day where you can do anything you like. So if you want to sleep, then sleep. If you want to watch a movie, you watch a movie. If you want to do nothing, do nothing. And um, yeah. that actually helps quite a bit. 
the, the, the freedom and flexibility. And then when mm -hmm. we're in port, uh, you know, we're usually anchored out. And so we, we do run into a few of the same problems there, but we have a lot of toys on, on board. You know, we have the dinghy that can take us to shore. We have kite boards, we have paddle boards, um, and we try and anchor in places where we can easily go to the beach. And so, you know, when people need to get away, they, maybe we'll swim to the beach or they'll go paddleboard into the beach and they'll go on like a walk or a run or, you know, just go snorkeling, uh, these sorts of things just to get a little bit of time to yourself. So there's a lot of options there. Absolutely. Cool. We, we haven't really had very many yeah. uh, confrontations that I can think of. Um, I think we do a good job of setting expectations for people ahead of time. So we say like, first of all, this is not a, a luxury five-star charter. Like this is mm -hmm. a working sailboat, your crew on the sailboat. If you come on board, you're going to do watch, you're going to cook, you're going to clean, um, you're going to do everything that we do, and we're not going to cater to you. So before you come mm -hmm. out, know that. And just kind of setting that up, uh, that this is not a holiday, this is not a vacation, this is a lifestyle. Uh, that helps. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed that you guys as are sometimes allowing guests as well uh, to uh, to join you guys, which is a pretty cool experience, especially for your viewers uh, to see, get a taste of what it's like to be with you guys. Um, yeah. Speaking of, of speaking of bringing on, uh, you said you guys bring about three months of food. What are the kind of the things that when you guys go on port, what do you guys load load up on in in terms of food and other supplies? Well, we we focus on a lot of like staple items. So you know we we always bake our own bread. So we get a lot of flour. We have flour, sugar, salt, rice, pastas, those sorts of things. And then we do have a fairly good size freezer on board. So we do freeze some meats, um, usually things that are compact. Uh, like we, we, we would never bring steaks because it's, it's just too much. Uh, but we would, for example, bring like ground beef or sausages, because with those you can you know, you can make a pasta and pasta dishes are very filling and you can add a little bit of meat for some protein, um, you know, and to supplement our diet. We're, when we're at sea, we're, we're always fishing. So we troll uh, fishing uh, lines behind the boat underway. And, you know, we're fishing for wahoo, tuna, mahi, um, things like that. And we, we, we have pretty good luck usually when we're in most places. Mm -hmm. Um you know, always a lot of teas, coffees, just, uh, I don't know, it's kind of funny, but if, if you would imagine what you would buy, uh, if you're going to leave and not be able to go to the store for like three months, you know, it's random things, yeah. pain relievers, Tylenol, <laughs> toilet paper. Um, Cosmo. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we bring some long life milk, uh, powdered milk. Um, yeah. All sorts of stuff. Eggs. Mm -hmm. Although uh, eggs and fresh vegetables, they tend to run out after about two or three weeks then then you're, you're living off canned foods and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, I just watched the video of you catching this massive lobster. And um, so how often are you guys catching your own food? Is that basically on a daily basis or is it just, is, is it less, uh, less uh, common? Well, it depends on where we are. You know, like uh, here in Annapolis, like it's just not going to happen because we're in the middle of a city. And I mean, we could go out fishing, but mm -hmm. it's just, you know, there's certain places where I think the the ocean can support us living off of it for an extended period of time. And, you know, one of those places, like you mentioned, the lobster was in the Bahamas. You know, we're, we're in an uninhabited island. Uh, we have a fishing license. We're allowed to take uh, a certain number of grouper and snapper and lobster uh, to have on the boat for any day, which depends on the number of people you have on board. And when we're in a place like that, you know, I would usually go out uh, spearing like maybe one or two times a week. And during that time, I could get enough food after an hour or two to last us, you know, for the whole week, most of the time. Um, like that big lobster I caught that, that was like four, mm -hmm. four meals for us. I mean, that's, you know, we made lobster mac and cheese. We made regular boiled lobster, lobster salad, like, you know, how many ways can you dream up to cook lobster? Um, yeah. So, uh, and when we were in Southeast <laughs> Asia, there was, you know, we, we went through these periods of time where the, the ocean was just so drained, you know, people were drag netting and we were in these extremely populated areas where the ocean had just been pilfered and we didn't catch a fish for like almost a year. I mean, we trolled the line everywhere and we didn't catch anything. And then we went across the Indian ocean where, there's virtually no population. And then we, you know, we had more fish than we could ever eat. And we actually had to stop fishing. So it, it varies widely depending on where we are. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, talking a little bit about sustainability, uh, where are you guys getting your energy source from? Are you uh, on the boat? Uh, the majority of it comes from solar power. So we have mm -hmm. uh, about 1500 watts of solar power on board uh, and we have two wind generators. And uh, when the sun is shining in the tropics and the wind is blowing, that provides more than enough power to run the entire boat. And, you know, we also we have a big inverter and we have lithium batteries. So we can even run our we have a washing machine. We can run off that. Um, you know, what powers the refrigerators, the freezers, the lights, the computers, uh, the satellite, everything. Uh, occasionally when we have bad weather uh, or more recently when we're up very north and the sun is not high in the sky, uh, or foggy days, we don't really get much from solar power. And in those cases, we have a generator. So it's a it's a diesel powered eight kilowatt generator. And uh, we basically can run that for about two hours, uh, which is very fuel efficient, only uses a few liters of fuel. And that will completely charge up the batteries. And then we can run off the batteries for a few days uh, mm -hmm. until they go down again and we need to charge them. So yeah, primarily wind and solar with a backup of the diesel generator a diesel yeah. okay yeah. yeah and what are maybe some other challenges that you guys face that most people maybe don't even think about with your lifestyle man you know uh i think one of the weird things is is not having an address you know like mm -hmm. imagine if you wanted to order something and you couldn't because you know you're like <laughs> Where do I send it? <laughs> Amazon uh, Prime to the ocean. <laughs> exactly. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's why, like, actually having a fixed address for even a few weeks is something very special to us. And we look forward to that. Whereas, you know, it's like, you know, I've, I've, you've never wanted a tomato or an avocado so much until you haven't had one for like two months. And you're like, oh, my gosh, what I would do to have just a tomato right now is amazing. The same thing with a shipping address. Um, you know, it's it's these small things like after you start traveling for a while, then, you know, you miss just sitting in one place and getting to know friends and family and having you know, a little bit of common scenery, like for example, knowing this is my favorite restaurant, this is my favorite grocery store, how I know where the best vegetables are. Like when that's constantly changing, it's very exciting. But then after a while you you're like, well, you know, I just wish I knew where everything was and I could go in and just get stuff that I wanted instead of having to figure it out again, you know, every every new port we pull into. Um yeah, so that's that's that could... that's one of the downfalls of the life and and also not being able to see our family regularly, right? You know, like my my dad and my mom live in Florida and they're getting a little bit older now. And so, you know, I, I want to be able to see them. Uh, Karen's uh, mom and her family lives in Sweden and we haven't seen her mom in over a year now because we can't fly there and, and she can't fly to the U S and come visit us. So that's been, that's been pretty hard to deal with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how often are you guys trying to, or how often are you trying to come back and, and visit, uh, a family or coming back to the States or Sweden? Uh, we usually try and do it at least once a year. Mm -hmm. uh, we either go to, to the U.S. Or, uh, or to Sweden once a year. So if we go to the U.S. one year, then we try to go to the Sweden the next year. Uh, so it's, you know, between seeing my family, it could be close to two years. Mm -hmm. I mean, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's I think one of the downsides, of course, of this of the lifestyle is that you know you you it's you you spend time away from those little moments with your family, you know, new births and weddings and all that stuff. Yeah, um, everything. So. And just hanging out and chatting, having you know random dinners and uh, um, having friends, you know, that that you're comfortable with and don't have to you know meet all over again. Uh, yeah, you know, every time you meet somebody is is something that it gets a little wearing after a while as well. Of course. Absolutely. I know exactly what you mean. Um, and so I was kind of curious when you guys are going into like the U S or Sweden or Philippines and anytime you go into a new country, how does it work with passports? Well, it, we, we adhere to the same rules that, and have to do the same process and things that you would do flying into an airport. So we still have to go through customs. We still have to go through immigration. The only difference is we have to do it ourselves. So in most places that you pull into, there's a few exceptions, but in most places you just pull up, you anchor up, you look for a port of entry. I put all of our passports and, you know, papers into a waterproof bag. We go into shore, we find the local police station or the customs and immigration authority. And then we go in and we say, hey, you know, we just arrived 
here's our papers, we pay our fees, we get our passport stamped, and then we, we get the same visa. You know, normally it's a three month visa that we get wherever we go. And there's some places that are a little bit different, like uh, India, for example. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had to uh, get visas ahead of time. We had to, you know, get the boat inspected by the Navy and the military. And um, uh, it's it's always, you know, that, that actually took three days to clear in. So we were not allowed to leave the boat for three days during that time. Whereas if you pull into like, oh, I don't know, Thailand, for example, you go in and they have a computer terminal sitting there and they say, well, type your information in here. And then 10 minutes later, you're done. You know, France is the same way. Any of the French islands in the Caribbean, they put these little computer terminals in all the coffee shops and bars. And so you go in and you can have like a nice croissant and a cup of coffee and then you check yourself in. You know, it's uh, so it's, it's always different. Right. But yeah. uh, generally and, the and, same and, rules. Yeah. yeah. And are there special ports? I've never actually sailed a boat into the country. Are there special ports for this or could it be any port whatsoever? There's usually designated ports of entry for most countries. And uh, there's a cool website called Noon Site, N-O-O-N-S-I-T-E. And if you go to that website and you look at the country and then you look in the formality section, it will tell you like, okay, you know, you can pull into this port because there's the customs and immigration office there, um, but not into this port. And, and it varies widely. Like some countries say, yeah, fine. Sail in wherever you want. Uh, check in whenever you get to a port. And, you know, some of them are very lenient. Uh, others are, are not so much. Um, the U.S., in fact, uh, allows you to do it via an app now on your phone. And you actually do, uh, you put in all your information ahead of time. You uh, do a video conference with them on your mobile phone. They verify everybody's face and then they say, OK, you're, you're cleared, which uh, I was I was pleasantly surprised to see that. Um, it was pretty cool. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty sweet. And so when you guys are, um, at a destination, how do you pick the next place you're going to? You guys just the roll the globe and pick a random spot, or you're trying to visit old friends or what <laughs> kind of guides your decision-making on what places to see? Uh, the weather. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, we, we pretty much live and die by the weather and the seasons. And so, you know, for example, one of the reasons we decided to sail up North to Maine is because, uh, it was uh, the hurricane season is coming to the Caribbean and the hurricane season every year for as far as everybody's been measuring hurricanes, it always starts in June and it ends in November. And so, you know, anybody that's sitting in those islands on their boat during those months and gets surprised by a hurricane while well, you're like, well, I mean, that happens every, every year at the same time. And I, I don't mean to sound jaded or, or you know, non-compassionate towards people, but, you know, planning, a few months ahead is a huge part of what we do. And so we left the Bahamas uh, in June and we sailed to Annapolis and then we sailed all the way up to the Canadian border and then had to turn around because the Canadian border was still closed because of COVID. Um, and uh, in August, a hurricane uh, went right over where we were. And so, you know, if, if we hadn't have moved, we definitely would have been, would have been hit by a, a pretty bad storm. Um, mm -hmm. and so we, we generally figure out like, if we're going to go to this area, this is the best season to go. Just like if you're going to schedule a vacation somewhere, you'd be like, well, what's the weather like, you know, during these months and okay, that sounds like a nice time to go. Well, we, we do the same thing. We just have to do it on a much slower scale because it takes us days or weeks to get somewhere rather than hours. Right. So we have to think ahead a little bit. Yeah. More. Yeah. And have you, have you guys gotten stuck in or, um, gotten hit by any big storms? Before. Oh, yeah, yeah. The the Indian Ocean was, uh, I mean, it's a huge ocean to cross. And you're you're out for so long, you know, the weather forecast is, is usually good for three to five days. Well, if you're on a 15 day sail, then, you know, that forecast is expired, and you still have a lot of the trip to go. And so, yeah, we've I mean, we've had waves breaking over the boat, the boat's been knocked on its side by waves off the coast of Australia, uh, off the coast of South Africa. Um, it, it can get pretty rough. Um, but I think the one thing that I learned early on is you mentally and as a person will break way before the boat does. So you just have to trust in the boat. You have to hang on, uh, try not to hurt yourself and wait it out. There's a, there's a saying, I have a big sign up above our nav station and it says, do not step. You, you, 
you never step down into the life raft. You always step up into the life raft. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the reason is, is that you're already on the best life raft that you could ever have. It's your mm -hmm. sailboat. And so if you, you know, if you leave a floating boat to get into your life raft, that's a terrible idea. You really want to wait until the boat deck is awash and she's definitely going down. There's been a lot of cases where people have abandoned their boats and they find the sailboat floating somewhere washed up on a beach months later and they never find this little tiny life raft, right? So, mm. uh, <laughs> And now some local Thai fisherman has a new uh, yacht that he can take his family out on. <laughs> or, yeah, or pillage, salvage, you know, strip, take all the parts off, sell them, you know. For sure. Mm -hmm. It happens. I've seen it a lot. Yeah. 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 And um, I know that you now have a new family member and crew member on board that'll be there permanently. What's it been like having a, uh, a baby on board and, and raising a family? <laughs> well, it's, it's incredible. It's amazing. Uh, I think the, the thing that I like the most is we get to spend all our time together as a family. Uh, you know, I, I can go out and I can I can feed Sierra and I don't have to worry about, you know, running off to the office because I have a morning meeting. You know, we make our own schedule. And so we can tend to make our schedule around the care and, and time that we like to spend with Sierra. And it's 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 amazing. You know, I get to show her just just we walked out of the boat and in, in the particular spot that we are right now, there's a huge amount of wildlife. And so there was actually uh, two deer like right by where our boat dock is. And so I took Sierra on deck and like, there's a, there's a deer right there, Sierra. And she sees that and she's like, well, what, you know, what is that crazy creature? And <laughs> she doesn't really understand because she's only 14 months now, but you know, she's already seen whales. She's already seen deer. She sees a lot of birds. She's seen seals. She's seen sharks. Uh, you know, it's like a real national or uh, biography lesson in, in real life for her. And uh, I'm pretty excited about being able to, to teach her, you know, about the ocean and about the world and about the environment uh, in a practical way, not just out of a book, right? Geography, society, history, those sorts of things. And uh, of I guess the, the downfall is it's, you know, I mean, I think this is not just because we live on a boat, but having a, a baby and a toddler is, you know, there goes all of your time. So we never, <laughs> we have much less free time than we do. We, we, you know, go out with friends a lot less than we do. There's really not that much eating out, but it's, it's, yeah. it's well worth it for sure. Yeah. That's so enriching yeah. for a child. It's like living in national geographic every day where exactly. you're just out in nature and you feel so in, in tune. Usually every year when I go diving in, in Thailand, I, it's just, you know, switching back to nature mode, being up with the sunrise, watching the sunset every day, diving, being in nature, it just completely realigns and changes everything compared to just sitting at home and, and you know, being on a computer screen, uh, especially for kids who like when I was living in Korea, some of the kids, they don't even see like animals anymore. They're just, they're just you know, animals on LED screens that they see at the mall. You know, they don't, they don't yeah. know what, what these animals actually look like. So it's it's, yeah. it's 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 the world that we're kind of moving towards. So it's it's nice that your, your, your child can, you know, still get the full taste of, of no, what it's, it's actually it's like. And, you know, you asked a little bit about what, you know, why we plan our, our, where we go. And, you know, right now uh, we're still up in, in Maryland and it's, you know, it's getting cold. It was uh, what, two degrees Celsius uh, the other night here, which is getting quite chilly. So we're planning our, to go further South. And I was thinking, well, Sierra is 14 months. By the time we get down there, she's going to be probably 18 months, a year and a half, you know, that's time to teach her to swim. So, you know, why don't we go down to like, uh, Belize uh, or Honduras and, and enjoy the warm tropical waters where we can have her, she can play on the beach. You know, I can take her swimming, maybe try and teach her to look under the ocean and see some cool things, turtles, all that stuff. Um, so that's, that's kind of our, our long-term plan anyway, based on, yeah, you know, just the weather and, and what we want to do as a family, which is cool. Yeah, that's great. It sounds nice that you guys are planning her swimming lessons months in advance and <laughs> like Belize while my mom would send me to the YMCA and I try to struggle to survive. <laughs> <laughs> so um, speaking of, of uh, you were talking a little bit about you, how your day to day has changed with your uh, with the new baby on board. What is like a typical day to day for you guys? What, what's your typical um, a normal day for you out in sea? Uh, well, it's yeah, given that, that we have Sierra now, it's always pretty much the same. You know, she wakes up early as uh, young babies do. And uh, I feed her breakfast or Karen feeds her breakfast. We kind of take turns. Uh, then I generally do um, a few hours of work in the morning. Sometimes it's computer work, emails, video editing, communications, all that stuff. 
And then we try and keep the afternoons free for exploring or hiking or, you know, I, I like to try and be done by work by like 1 p.m. every day, uh, have lunch and then be done with work and uh, and then have the whole afternoon to to do whatever, you know, for in tropical waters, we'll, we'll go to the beach, I'll go kiteboarding, um, we'll go scuba diving, we'll go snorkeling. Sometimes we just sit around and do nothing, which is awesome too. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That's that's cool. And just out of curiosity, regarding scuba, scuba diving, do you guys have like a generator on board to fill up oxygen tanks, or do you guys get them just from local spots? No, we do. We have a we have a compressor on board, uh, and mm-hmm. so we can dive. Uh, we have a pretty much a mini dive shop on Delos. We have enough gear to take uh, four or five people diving at the same time. We have dive computers. We have BCDs. We have regs. We have uh, tanks and bottles, and then we have the compressor to refill everything. And sometimes we'll do. You no, know, that's that's another reason why I'm quite keen to go down to Central America is because you know Belize has apparently the second largest uh, barrier reef in the world, and uh, you know, we can go down there in the boat and we can sit and we can just dive for a few weeks. And Wow. You know, that's, and that sounds like a scuba diver's dream to be able to have their own dive shop on board and just pick their own locations. Yeah. I always go to the same four spots in Koh Tao, Thailand. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's also like whenever we do dive with a dive shop, like in some places, you're, you're not allowed to dive on your own because it, it's, you know, I, they say it's for the environment, but I really think it's so that, you know, it stimulates the local economy, which, which is of fair course. enough. Um, but, uh, you know, they say, well, how long of a dive do you want to go for? Like, we can go for like three, four dives today. Each dive can be like, you know, 60 minutes and we can change tanks. And I'm like, you know what, man, honestly, we're just going to dive again tomorrow. So we'll just go on one dive today. We'll make it 30 to 45 minutes. We'll come up, we'll relax, and then we'll go again tomorrow. You know, because I think some people, they try and pack everything in. And uh, when when you have time, it, it opens up a lot of opportunities for you like that, right? Yeah, absolutely. When you're just crushing out dives during the, throughout the day, or just high residual nitrogen still in your bloodstream, yeah. there's really no reason to be crushing it just out. Like, ah, I'll just, we'll just go again tomorrow. It's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna risk decompression sickness so I can dive five times today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's cool. So uh, speaking of, if somebody, for example, um, some young person in their 20s wanted to follow the same path and they were interested in doing a similar adventure that you're up to and getting uh, their own sailboat, um, how would you recommend going about it and how much money would you recommend, you know, maybe let's say bare minimum uh, in order to invest in a boat, in order to live in maybe let's say six months or 12 months and where would you recommend to go? Well, I'd say, first of all, you don't have to have your own boat to do this lifestyle. Uh, in fact, before we were making the videos, we used to take a lot of people on board to help us sail and to help share the expenses. So just like you might decide to go on a, a road trip across the country with a few friends, and you guys chip in and you share gas money and rental fees and lodging and all that, you can do the same thing on a sailboat. And we used to charge people $125 a week uh, to come on the boat that included everything, including their food. So it was like, I think in euros, it was like 15 euros per person per day or something like that. Um, and there's a lot of that out there. So, you know, you can, you can walk the docks, you can meet people, um, you can make friends that have a sailboat. And then the next thing you know, you're off for a, a month or two. Um, there's also some bigger, more organized places. Like our friends want to run a program called uh, Infinity. It's called Expedition Infinity. And they take, it's basically like a backpacking sailboat. You know, they have 20 or 25 people on board. Uh, everybody chips in for cost. And then they go sail to some amazing destination. Um, places to do that? Well, I mean, pretty much anywhere you are that there's a local sailing club or a marina. Uh, I mean, there's hot spots like in the Caribbean uh bvi is is a hot spot for chartering uh puerto rico for cruising like antigua grenada um if you're in these places then you know and and also there's you know if you're in like new zealand and australia there's staging points for making the next jump so for example before we crossed uh, uh from new zealand to australia uh everybody was in auckland getting ready to go 
And so you have all the boats there that are going to make the jump. The same thing, Thailand is a big staging point for crossing the Indian Ocean because it's it's a natural point to go west. And Mexico is a big staging point like Puerto Vallarta for people crossing the South Pacific to, to New Zealand. And so if you happen to be around one of these places um, and you can find a boat, then that's, that's a great way to go. Uh, there's also a website called Find a Crew. Uh, I haven't personally used that one, but, you know, there's usually people on boats uh, looking for help. They're like, well, you know, we're a, a husband and a wife. Uh, we're going on a long sail. We could sure use one more person or a couple to come along and help us run the boat, pay your own expenses, yada, yada. Uh, if you want to get your own boat, well, then I think one of the first things that I did is uh, I joined uh, a local uh sailing club, like a dinghy sailing club to learn to sail small boats. Uh, and that was incredibly helpful because when you're sailing a small, even nine or 10 foot boat, that's where you're probably going to learn more about sailing than you would on a big boat, just because you can feel the changes. You can feel the wind, you can feel the impact of nature on you. Um, I also joined a race crew. So like, you know, there's, there's people that, that go out racing, like on Wednesdays or Saturdays, they have like a club race. They're always looking for help. Um, and so you can go out and you can learn an, an incredible amount of sailing that way. And there's also people that just, you know, I had a, a friend, uh, and I don't know if you've seen this documentary, if you haven't, you should check it out. It's called chasing bubbles, uh, B U B B L E S chasing bubbles. He was a, uh, market commodities trader in Chicago. He, I think he made a little bit of money. He bought a $60,000 boat, which might sound like a lot, but as far as sailboats go, that's a pretty, pretty good bargain. And he set off to sail around the world uh, in two and a half years. And he had very little on his boat. He just had like a handheld GPS that he used to keep strapped to his neck with a, a shoelace. And um, he had an incredible adventure. And he he also took people along the way to, to help him pay the trip. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and th it's such a topic. There's, I mean, there's, there's books and there's websites and consulting services dedicated just to help people get out sailing. So it's can be quite involved, but uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you can also just, you don't have to sail around the That's, world do you. You can also buy a boat and, you know, in Florida and you can cruise down the keys, you can go cruise to the USVIs and you can hop in the Caribbean and that's quite, you know, nice leisurely sailing and a good way to get into it. And then you can decide if you're going to spend 20 days at sea crossing an ocean, you know, you, you don't have to do that right away. Yeah. And I know you probably been like hating to, have, or you probably hate being asked this question, but what were some of your favorite places that you've been so far? Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> this <is> well, exciting. <laughs> I, I really, uh, okay. First of all, I really dug New Zealand. I thought New Zealand was just a very special place. Uh, just the people are so kind. The location is crazy. You can go from beaches and surfing to climbing a glacier, you know, in, in one or two days on the South Island. Um, Philippines, you know, we, we went to the Philippines for, uh, we were supposed to spend two months there. We ended up spending 10 months there just because we loved it so much. There's, there's like 7,107 islands in the Philippines. Uh, super friendly people. Um, I also really liked uh, Madagascar. Madagascar is, is a very hard place to get to, but if you can get to Madagascar, it is, it is definitely worth it. Um, Brazil, Brazil mm -hmm. was super cool. I know there's, I could go on and on and on I, each place for, you know, for very different reasons. It, it really depends on, on, you know, do you want to go there for anchoring in uninhabited islands where there, you have the entire island to yourself? Uh, that's a possibility. You know, you go to the Bahamas, that's easy. Uh, you want to go for like, you know, a French cultural fine dining experience. Well, you know, there's plenty of islands in the Caribbean to that. You can go sail the Med. I mean, it's, it's all over the place, right? It's, you, you can definitely choose your location on what you're into. Like we just, when we were up in Maine, we went to this island. Uh, we went to Acadia National Park because we wanted to go hiking. And so we anchored the boat in the middle of Acadia National Park and we went hiking for like a month. You know, every day we would take the dinghy into shore. We would go hiking uh, up, uh, you know, a different trail every day, and and that's that's what we wanted to do. So that's why we put the boat there. So, yeah, all Great. sorts of different places. And, uh, 
Yeah, I know. It's a tough question. Now, people always ask that. Where's your favorite place? And so it's always tough. But, I, you know, I always think three or four or five places always pop up in your head that, you know, yeah, first ones that all come for, to All for to different mind. reasons too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, but yeah, as we're wrapping things up, are there any other tips uh, or takeaways that you would like uh, viewers to, to, to be left with that might be interested in following the same route? Huh. I'd say like most of the people that I've seen doing the sort of thing that feel like they're running from something, they quite often bring whatever it is along with them. And so, you know, you, you can change your environment, but, you know, unless you're, you're really willing to change yourself from within, then you're just going to bring along your angst and your anxiety and your troubles, your troubles a lot with you. Um, and, uh, I guess, you know, if you're going to embark on a trip like this, do it from, you know, inside of you, do it from your heart, from your soul, because you want to travel and you want to explore, um, maybe not necessarily do it because you want to be able to, to send cool pictures over social media to other people. Cause you know, then I, I, I don't know if that's right to say, but that's just the way I, I feel about it. Um, and then maybe the last thing is if, if you ever, uh, have, you find yourself at a decision point in life where you have one route that is potentially like super easy. And the other one that, that makes you a little bit nervous and puts that knot in the bottom of your stomach, seriously look at the one that challenges you and puts that knot in your stomach. Because even if you fail uh, at what you're trying, then most likely you'll, you'll learn and, and come out of it, you know, ahead and, and you probably will be just fine and it'll be really exciting. And uh, that's, that's what I think life is all about is, is trying new things and pushing it a little bit. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just uh, started an uh, improv comedy about a, a year ago. Oh, wow. And, um, <laughs> yeah. And I had that crazy, like, anxiety, nervousness before our first show. And, you know, it's good to identify that feeling. And then, you know, I'm like, okay, this is how I should be feeling because it means I'm growing. It means I'm doing something uh, that's making me feel uncomfortable. So, yeah. uh, and then, of course, after, you know, a month, it doesn't become so, um, you know, it doesn't give me that as much anxiety. It's like fun now. And, and now the, the next thing is, you know, presenting in front of 200 people or whatever. So it, it's, I think I always like identifying that feeling that you're talking about where you're like, oh, okay, I feel uncomfortable doing this. And that's a kind of a good starting point to say, okay, why? And this is probably a good path for me to follow in order to grow. So. Absolutely. But, yeah. you, you know, just putting your, the, just the act of putting yourself out there a little bit changes you, I believe. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And especially like in terms of your um, situation by, by following a path that, you know, not many people, at least not a decade ago, I probably, w- it probably wasn't as common, um, you know, following that going against the, going against the grain of what everyone else is doing. It's, it's de- definitely not an easy decision to make. And I think that the story that you always hear when people do embark on these kind of adventures is, Oh, I'm only going to go for a year or I'm only going to go for 18 months and right, ends up, right. you know, turning into much, much, much longer. Uh, speaking of that, are, are there any plans or uh, any thoughts of when uh, you're going to let's say uh, put your, put your uh, boots up and, and pack up and go back <laughs> to, back you know, to being al- a land animal. We've always said uh, if it ever stops being fun, you know, if, if mm-hmm. there's ever a day where we wake up and you're like, you know what, this isn't fun anymore. I want to do something different. Then that'll be the time to think about that. Um, yeah, that's mm-hmm. about it. Cool. Yeah. I like that. Like Richard Branson style, you know, it's going to be fun <laughs> doing it. I like it. Yeah. Very cool. Why not? Right. All right. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, of my course. Pleasure. It's a great, that's, I actually, I, I'm always also, that's also one of my indicators too, of when I take on new projects or new decisions, it's like, am I going to enjoy this? Is it going to be fun? Am I going to learn? So I think that's, that's, that's a good, good question to ask yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, as we're wrapping things up here, we usually end our uh, show with a, a travel tribe toss up where we just ask three questions. Oh, boy. And, uh, I'm never good at these rapid can, fire yeah. questions. <laughs> I'll try that. <laughs> just the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Um, and oh, yeah. So, first one is what is the most embarrassing moment or cultural misunderstanding you've had abroad? Oh. <laughs> 
Uh, I was once in uh, Vanuatu and um, uh, we were drinking this substance called kava and we were advised to only drink two bowls of that uh, by the chief of the village. And I ended up drinking two and a half bowls, which led to me and, and all my, my brother and all our friends with us violently puking. And then the chief of the village had to uh, clear his his daughter and uh, out of out of uh, their hut so that we could sleep on the floor because we were incapable <laughs> of taking ourselves home. So that was that was a little embarrassing. Uh, also, I was one time in India and there was some cows running down the street and I was trying to wear like a, like a sarong thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I didn't have it tied up properly. And I ran off down the street um, to film these cows with the camera. And it turned out that my sarong had opened up and I wasn't <laughs> wearing any underwear. So I was literally running down the street, just <laughs> as you could imagine, not a, not a, not a good naked by any means. Uh, and the people on the side of these very conservative Indians are like, well, why is he chasing a cow and why is naked. he doing it half naked? Um, <laughs> what do these Americans want with our cows? <laughs> yeah, it's like, geez. Uh, that, that was a little embarrassing, but we, we got over it. <laughs> oh, man, that's great. All right. Uh, question two. What moment comes to mind uh, that made your heart sing with joy? Oh, man, that's easy. Like the birth of my daughter. You know, we, we moved to Sweden uh, because uh, the, the health care in the U.S. is, is well, I don't even want to talk about it. But we decided to, to give birth in Sweden and just seeing her, her come to life was was incredible and amazing. And every day it's like that, you know, when I get to wake her up. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, OK, and last question. What was the most unusual food you have eaten? Oh, that's easy. <laughs> There's this thing called... Uh, Balut in the Philippines, and it's uh, it's basically a fertilized duck egg, and they take the egg and they fertilize it, and then they you can get balut that's like twelve days or eighteen days or sometimes twenty four days old, and then they steam it, and so you're supposed to crack open the shell, and then instead of there being a yolk in there, there's actually a bird embryo, and you're supposed to drink the juice out of the top of the egg. And then uh, you basically eat the little duck inside. And so, uh -huh. you know, depending on how developed it is, you know, it's, there's bones in there, there's feathers, you're getting stuff stuck in your teeth. And it, it's a delicacy in the Philippines, but like I, I tried it and I vomited. I couldn't handle it. It was just too gross, which doesn't make any sense because I eat eggs and I eat, you know, chicken or duck, but I don't, the in-between state just seems so weird. Um, yeah. Yeah. It, and, and also it's fermented. I was, I was, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's sort of steamed and then it tastes a little bit fermented. And then I guess the second follow up to that would be that kava experience I told you about in Vanuatu. They actually uh, the way they prepare that is they have uh, about 12 people sitting in a ring and they chew that the, the kava is a root. They put it in their mouth and they chew it up. And then they, everybody spits it into a huge steaming pile. So into this banana leaf and they spit the kava chunks into this leaf. And then they strain that through a coconut husk. And then that's what you drink. So when you drink that kava uh, in Tana in Vanuatu, you're actually drinking like the spit of 12 people, um, which is quite gross. What? So they collect all the, the spit and then they uh, strain it through a coconut leaf and then you drink the spit? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you're supposed to right? be drinking the kava, but they don't have a grinder. So the way they grind it up is by using their teeth, right? Um, which is oh supposedly why it's so powerful there is because there's something the way that the saliva starts to break down the, the root and allows it to be absorbed by your, your system a lot more readily. That's why it's real potent there. Uh, but yeah, uh, you're, you're literally oh drinking so a bunch of stuff that, that a bunch of people have chewed up and then spit out. Yeah. It's great. Sounds like <laughs> fraternity hazing going on out there. <laughs> so that's also pretty gross. <laughs> yeah. And just I'm out of, I just out of curiosity, what what's in this is kava? Is it, are these cocoa beans? Or sorry, are these coffee beans or what what is no, this kava? No, it's it's a uh, it's a nar it's it's really a narcotic. Uh it's it's a cross between uh caffeine and a narcotic. It's it's a pepper root family. But in in the right dosages, mm -hmm. it can it can uh, give you uh I don't know how to describe it. Uh, maybe like a cross between a pot brownie and MDMA, something like that. If anybody's okay. ever sampled those. Yeah. And, and what country is 
What country do they do this in? Well, you'll first start seeing it in Tonga, and then you'll see it in Fiji, and then you'll see it in Vanuatu, where it's the strongest. So it's it's Melanesia, the whole area of Melanesia, but most primarily in those three countries, Tonga, Fiji, and Vanuatu. Mm-hmm. Um, in small doses, it, it has a very and, calming effect and it gives you, it helps you sleep good and it, it helps you, you know, it gives you really cool dreams at night. And, uh, but in, in larger doses, it, it can, it's like, they, they use it for religious ceremonies mostly in Vanuatu. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's, and it's legal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it is there anyway. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Well, I, I think it's, I think, you know, my oh, dad I'm... used to take the Kava pills, uh, you know, but I think they're like such low doses. It's just the calming effect. I don't know, search on it. K-A-V-A. Yeah. Kava. Mm-hmm. Crazy stuff. Interesting. I'll have to look that up. I never heard of that. Yeah. Look at that. New <laughs> new drug for the kids to try. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't mind drinking other people's spit, why not? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully do that. And they just weren't like, you know, pulling your leg because you're the foreigner. Yeah, They're like, oh, yeah, great. now we drink all the spit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well, cool. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to uh, come on our podcast. I really enjoyed learning about adventure and um, hearing all about your stories and different things and also about your new baby, which is really fantastic to add to the family you have over there. Thank if people you. wanted to follow your adventures and see some of the videos you have, where could they find you? Probably the best place is just to go to YouTube and type in SV for sailing vessel and then Delos S V D E L O S like the Greek Island. Uh, we're on YouTube there, the same thing on Instagram, Facebook, or you can just type in S V Delos in uh, Google or any search engine. It should pull up all of our stuff. And um, yeah, that's it. Check it out. And thank you. Great. So yeah, we'll leave that in the show notes. Uh, there are uh, SV Delos is all over social media. They're on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Patreon. So you can check them out there. Check out some of their content. They have fantastic video of catching fish and lobsters and being out in the middle of the ocean with the family. It's really cool stuff. So uh, you can check it out there. Brian, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. And fair winds. Yeah, thank you. I uh, appreciate your time and wishing everybody an amazing day. Take care. Well, that does it for this week's episode of Travel Tribe Podcast. Join us each Tuesday as we release new episodes with great adventures. Until then, remember, the most dangerous thing you can do in life is to play it safe. Stay adventurous.